Welcome to the Nightly News Podcast. This is Professor Miller sitting in today with Professor Jared Reif. Jared, thank you so much for joining the podcast today. I'm glad to be here. Thanks so much, Paul. It's always a pleasure. What we're here talking about today is the upcoming Humanities Film Series that we're doing here on the Summerdale campus of Central Penn College. Professor Reif will be doing Jaws, which will be taking place on Friday, January the 26th, that'll be a 6.30 start time. Uh, there'll be about a 30-minute talkback session, and then there'll be uh, the screening of the movie, and then a Q&A afterward. Mm-hmm. Um, this is something that we, have, as a department, have been working on for quite some time, and I think that we're very, very much looking forward to seeing Professor Reif and seeing what uh, he comes up with with Jaws. I, I'm, I'm excited about it. This is, I'm really, this, I, I think this is a fantastic opportunity for us, and I obviously we'll talk about that, but I'm jazz, so I'm happy to see people there. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Um, one of the things that I wanted to chat about with you today is really kind of how this whole production came to be. I know I had uh, Dr. Ellsworth on previously, yep. and we talked a little bit about this, but from your perspective, why was this something when it first, when we first started talking about this, oh my gosh, it must have been about six months ago, mm-hmm. why was this something that you immediately stepped up to the plate and wanted to be involved with? Well, this was part of my undergraduate experience, uh, was film series, uh, and different departments or even uh, different areas. I remember some, there was a great one actually at the library too that had a bunch of archival films that they do these film series ever so often. And so uh, Dr. Ellsworth and I went to the same undergrad institution, so I think our background with these happening and their frequency uh, kind of struck a familiar chord. Um, And I think movies are, along with other, are kind of these universal mediums, right? People can get around them uh, and can view them and have them from different experiences. And I think that as as a, in terms of art form, in terms of entertainment, they kind of strike all those chords and hit all those buttons for people. Uh, so I think it's a way for me uh, to kind of get it to continue to do what I enjoy, which is teaching. And I guess you get to do it in a different environment, and maybe a different time of day, and then maybe in a different classroom. But we get to have that kind of learning experience, and we get to kind of do it to collectively. So what was it about? I mean, I know that you said that this was part of your undergraduate you know, experience. What was it about film maybe earlier on in your life that, or, or maybe do you have a film that stands out to you as one that really kind of puts you into getting out of watching film as entertainment and mm-hmm. more of it as an art form? Sure. Um, actually, it, that's interesting that you asked that question because I had to kind of think a little bit because there is a distinction. There's that side of me that enjoys film for just its pure entertainment value, um, whether it's good or bad. Um, and so it's kind of a, there's a couple of things. I think the first thing is that my mother loved watching movies. She grew up in uh, in Los, the Los Angeles area, and so she had friends and people that she knew who went to go on to be in, in the industry. Um, she had people that she grew up around that were in her neighborhood that worked in the industry. And so she got to see not necessarily a behind-the-scenes look necessarily at how films are made or how things are produced, but she became kind of a, was able to appreciate them, and she got to kind of see uh, how things are put together. And so growing up, she would often, and she loved uh, kind of horror and sci-fi, uh, the genre, but she would sit down and she would tell me, oh, see how they're doing this with this lighting here, or see how they're putting the camera here, or look at this, like look how they did the makeup, or look how they did that. Uh, and so she kind of began to kind of break it down for me. But I think the first real film that kind of moved me beyond uh, just sitting in a seat, whether it be in your front room or a movie theater, and being kind of entertained and taught, was actually a little short. It's actually a French film called The Red Balloon, um, made in the in the mid '50s, uh, and they actually showed it to us as elementary school. And I'm guessing the elementary school teacher was like, "I just need to give these kids something to do. I need a break." And it's a it's a story about a boy, and it is just a red balloon uh, that kind of follows him around the streets of Paris, uh, and they kind of have these interactions throughout the day. And you become kind of emotionally connected to this inanimate object of a red balloon that becomes uh, this companion to this young man. Um, And I don't want to spoil it, but they have to uh, essentially kind of elude a a gang of boys that begins to pursue them. And it seems to kind of dislike this relationship that is happening between this boy and this balloon. Um, 
And that has always kind of had an impression on me and left a mark with me that there was a way to thematically and through cinema, not only just tell a story, but cause you to kind of question and think about things. And so that was really kind of my break, I think, uh, as, a, as a young student. And I don't know if I just fully realized it as a, you know, elementary kid, but I was able to kind of draw from that and be able to see those similar things or those similar ideas or raise similar questions about movies when I would sit and think another one. Uh, probably the next film, I think, that really kind of did that for me uh, was Schindler's List in 1993. And obviously, it's an emotionally charging story. But again, this is and then this is another Spielberg film. So maybe it's something also having to do with Steven Spielberg. But it again, I think, kind of raised questions and assumptions, and kind of muddied the waters a little bit in terms of kind of the right and wrong. And I think, with especially with a lot of our kind of pop culture uh, films, kind of those summer movies, it, there's always the clear good and the clear bad. And and there's been a recent movement with with television and film to maybe kind of muddy that a little bit and have this anti-hero, uh, you know. Uh, like a, a Breaking Bad type character, right? Where you, you're kind of rooting for this bad good guy or good bad guy, whatever it might be. Uh, but still at our core, I think we still appreciate seeing kind of the good versus the evil. But movies like that, I think, kind of pushed me beyond it and allowed me to kind of think about it a little bit more and be a little more evaluated of what and how cinema is used and how films are used and how they're produced. Um, so yeah, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that when we do meet together uh, here in a few weeks uh, to talk about Jaws. One of the things that I always uh, enjoyed when I was in high school, in fact, I, I always remember, I, I'm sure my mom will, will hear this, but I always remember um, when I was younger, I lived very close to the movie theater. So mm -hmm. I lived, you know, like a two-block walk oh, from the theater. And I remember that I, at, at probably about 16, uh, maybe even 15, I would buy a ticket for, you know, a PG-13 movie and I'd, mm -hmm. I'd sneak into some of the R-rated movies. And, and, <laughs> and it was, it was, I'm glad that I did in as far as it was, it was really important for me in my study of communication mm -hmm. to understand the medium of film. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've noticed, um, I teach a Communications 100 class in which we do uh, an entire week on film. And one of the things that, I try to get students to do in that class is think critically mm -hmm. about film because I think so many of our students come in and they are just used to watching film as an entertainment and, and leave and maybe they have some questions about the movie but they don't really think about the themes that are behind it and when I first started teaching and, and trying to explain to students what the difference is between a movie review and a film analysis mm. um, that really opened my eyes to the way that that our students view film and one of the things that I always remember is that um, I will never forget some of my students who have done a film analysis now who have looked at one of their favorite films critically have a much different appreciation for the film now in your experiences what is it about that critical thinking and, and looking at a film as an art form that really maybe makes a change in the way that we as a society look at film that's a great question um i think part of it and i think you've kind of alluded to it already is uh, not being passive but engaging with it as a work right and so i think there are a couple of questions that we often ask ourselves when it comes to any sort of kind of art form about how the work is developed, how it's constructed, what are the meanings behind it, why was it successful when it was, uh, how has it continued to kind of remain successful. And and I think a lot of ways, uh, that's what that kind of critical element really allows, I think, students or even moviegoers in general to do, um, is it, when you separate it from a form of entertainment um, and you kind of become... Uh, and maybe a good sports analogy is a little bit here too, right? I mean, we often, you know, those who follow teams are our fans, they're fanatics. Uh, you know, they yell their TV screens or yell at the coach or call in to the radio program, right? They're engaged. They're critical. They they disagree with maybe something or they agree with something or they want to know the reasons behind things are the way that they are. And I think when you move beyond that level, when you get into that level of engagement and you get into that kind of emotional and mental state where you begin to really kind of pull apart the things and see what's underneath, uh, that the film really becomes art, right? And it becomes uh, something that is okay, right, for you to still go and see, 
disagree with it, but appreciate it for what it's worth. And then in turn, right, as you're talking about this assignment with your students, you then communicate that to others, right? And the conversation continues. Whereas entertainment is, oh, wow, did you see that film? Yeah, it was great. So much fun. Love that one scene. Oh, yeah, it was wonderful. And then that's it. But if it's, oh, I went and saw this film, and man, why did they do this? Or do you think that this has something to do with something maybe in the political landscape or a historical fact? Or, you know, why is the, why is the director trying to kind of question this belief maybe held by the audience? Then the dialogue continues, right? And then it becomes something much different than just entertainment. One of the things that I noticed uh, over break was obviously it had a, a little bit more chance than, than usual to be able to watch a couple of movies. Mm -hmm. And there was one that I, I saw on and I recorded it. And I watched it again. I probably haven't watched it in about 10 years. It's one called, you, stop me if you've heard of this one, The Wizard of Oz. Mm. Um, and one of the interesting things is when you read a little bit more about that film and, and all mm -hmm. the things that went into that film and all the hardships that went into that film and really how uh, horrifically Judy Garland was treated at the mm -hmm. time. And But when you look more into it in a more thematic ways, it, it really speaks differently to you than than it did when you were a kid and a kid it just had this you know larger than life you know you've got all these these characters who you know self-admittedly don't have a certain thing mm -hmm. and you know they're willing to go to the ends of the earth to get it but when you start looking at that at the the larger thematic elements of the wizard of oz it really gives you a much different perspective of the film another one that i look back to in my career of, of being a film buff, I suppose you would say, is a movie like Fight Club. Mm. Um, a movie like Fight Club, on the surface, it seems very straightforward, but the more you peel back the layers, the more and more you see of corporate greed is a, is a very big thematic element, um, and, and there are a lot of other things that, that go along with that. It, and you know, when I bring up Fight Club, everyone's like, well, that movie is just about violence. And to be honest with you, really the only Fight Club segments are, are only a very, very small part and sort of more of a means to, to an end as far as the thematic elements of it. And so when you look at movies like that, when you look at some of your favorite films and you start to think about them in a more critical way, it really gives you much more of an appreciation. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember also being a, a early Tarantino fan as well. Mm -hmm. St still do. Some of his more recent films ha haven't necessarily done it for me, but certainly um, it really helped me early on to understand what it meant to be a director and what the director brings to the table and why certain directors you might appreciate their, their films more than others. Now, you'd mentioned Steven Spielberg. I mean, you're talking about a guy that, you know, his resume is, you know, <laughs> heads above everybody else's. So what is it about Spielberg uh, maybe that interests you? Is there certain thematic elements that he does or certain things he does in his films that makes uh, him more appealing to you? Uh, absolutely. I, I think the things that I do enjoy about Spielberg are actually the, these kind of wide camera shots that he often has, right? And uh, a good example, and you, you see it throughout his films in different kind of areas. A great example of it, I think, is perhaps that opening scene a beach scene in Saving Private Ryan, where as the camera is kind of panning across this battlefield, you begin to take in the scope of the world that he's wanting for you to create. Uh, often so much in in films, especially because of the, the use of the camera, things get intimate, right? So you get the, the close-up of the face or the conversation, different than maybe perhaps, you know, like a stage theater where you, it's, you're still taking in what's going on in the whole scene. But when Spielberg pulls back and we have this very kind of wide-angle shot, you begin to understand that his, uh, that he is trying to give you this art form that is not just about the characters whose names you're going to remember or the actors and actresses whose faces you recognize, but there are people beyond that, right? That the story continues beyond that. Um, and that's something that I enjoy also that we get, especially with Jaws, because Jaws is actually his first directorial debut in film. He'd done uh, TV episodes and, and things like that. And, and I'll talk more kind of a little bit about uh, the what Jaws was like and that it was kind of over budget uh, or at least was going to run out of money and there were problems on set and as you could imagine filming in the ocean has its own set of kind of uh, difficulties but we still get this idea even though we have kind of these central figures that there are these stories behind them right and when we see these other people when we see these individuals and I think he's able to have people connect to those people right and you kind of get this sense uh, about them 
uh, and you want to you want to invest more in kind of what he does. So that's something that I enjoy that I think he does particularly well. And obviously, when you continue to have those successes again and again and again, you know, Indiana Jones and E.T. and Jurassic Park and the list continues to go on and on and on, then people, I think, also appreciate that as well. And he's also involved in the new film, The Post, which is going mm-hmm. to be released here shortly. And mm-hmm. one of the interesting things that I've heard in some early commentary about that film is that even though it's a film about something that happened, you know, about 40, 50 years ago, um, there's a lot of modern day parallels to mm-hmm. our, our current administration sure. and uh, the way that they are trying to decrease the freedom of the press in, mm-hmm. in some way. So I, I thought that that was interesting, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing that. Well, um, moving on, uh, obviously we're here today with Professor Jared Reif. He will be doing his uh, Humanities Film Series on Jaws. That'll come up on Friday, January 26th at 6.30. That's free. And we're also in the works right now for trying to do, I know when Adrian was on, she's, she's very excited about having some themed food. So there's going to be all kinds of uh, fun out there. Uh, so, you know, Jared, what was it about Jaws that could, because for me, when we first talked about this, I knew immediately I wanted to do this, mm-hmm. but I didn't know immediately what I wanted to do. Um, I'm a, I'm a big Christopher Nolan fan. I was considering doing Dark Knight, um, or certainly Dark Knight Rises or, or certainly like Memento, something else that he's done. I, I mentioned I'm a big Tarantino fan. Uh, I was thinking about maybe doing one of those films, but I settled on something who I'm also a big fan of, the Coen brothers. Mm -hmm. And uh, The Big Lebowski ranks up there as as one of my favorite movies ever. And I also think it's one that has a a cult following to the point where I I know I can get some people to come down. I know a lot of people that are fans of the movie. But I think that there's a lot to be said about the film. Mm -hmm. I think that everyone that comes to see The Big Lebowski that evening is going to learn so much about the film and they're going to view that film during the screening in a much, much different and more critical way. And isn't that really the purpose of doing these? Absolutely, right? And and this is, I think, a great opportunity not only just for the campus community but for the community at large, right? The area kind of surrounding the school. Uh, and, and for that group to come in and to be able to appreciate um, that experience. I grew up in a kind of a university town, and so there are always these things going on, uh, you know, plays and film and musical people coming in and these series and, and all sorts of opportunities for the campus uh, to kind of cross over that border uh, of the college line where, you know, you have the sign and school starts here kind of a thing and flow out into the community and flow out into uh, the people who are around them. And so and it's and it, it it makes the classroom wider, right? It brings in those additional voices, those different experiences, and allows for that dialogue to really kind of happen. And so, I think part of the reason that I kind of settled upon Jaws uh, is that not too long ago it actually kind of celebrated its 40th anniversary, uh, and it actually was kind of re-released in selected theaters across the country, and um, and people still went and saw it, but. I think especially what I kind of thought about, I also thought about my students. You know, most of my students, uh, except for a few very choice and, and wonderful ones, are under that limit and haven't actually seen the film. But they still perhaps recognize the kind of cultural cachet that it still kind of has. Uh, and we see maybe, the, you know, kind of the, the children or the grandchildren of Jaws with things like Shark Week or the, you know, the Sharknado series. In fact, which Roy Schneider even kind of has like a little cameo, I think, in the, in the Sharknado 4 or wherever, where, whatever number we're on now, right? Um, so the, the, what Jaws did in terms of changing how people view this animal but in the ocean still resonates today. Uh, and so I think that's kind of why I uh, selected Jaws, because I mean, oftentimes, and I'll talk about this in the presentation as well, I mean, we can often tell when a film is good or bad because it resonates with the audience, right? Uh, and one of the best ways that people uh, kind of show that is they go and see the film, right? So, you know, the, the movie that usually makes, you know, $20 million is maybe not a film that really touches people or lets people kind of communicate with them, but the film that often makes more money does that. And Jaws, in fact, did that, right? And, to, you know, when Jaws first came out, it was the highest grossing film kind of to date. Uh, uh, and, and they kind of approached things, and I'll talk about how they did that a little bit in the presentation. But the fact that uh, people still, you know, you hear that little that little tuba uh, of, of John Williams, you know, dun dun that people automatically kind of know what that is, even though they may not have seen the film, right? Or they're scared of the ocean because of this. I have an aunt 
uh, who, after seeing the film, would not go in the ocean, right? And they lived in this kind of, uh, you know, near the beach. She didn't go in the ocean for like a, several years, right? Kind of her, she was she was afraid of it. But shark attacks are, are you know, all, the sharks didn't all of a sudden say, all right, Jaws came out, you guys. Let's head on out there and, and live up to the name, right? Um, so I'll talk about some of those things as well with the presentation. But I, I love at least that aspect of it, right? So there'll be people, hopefully, who will show up that night when we view the film who were there in that audience in 1975 uh, or or people who, um, you know, whose kids went to it. But then we'll also have, you know, students, younger students who, you know, whose parents are the ones who saw it, but not necessarily them. So well, what? Uh, so I understand all of these things. So whenever you think about Jaws, you know, one of the things that I, from a, from a film historian, mm-hmm. I know not to, implying that I'm a film historian by any stretch of the imagination, but one of the things that you can look back to Jaws is Jaws was really one of the original summer blockbuster films and has basically ever since then, outside of the Star Wars franchise, almost every big budget movie is going to come out between the months of May and really July. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Some of them bleed into August, August a yeah. little bit, but a lot of people are on vacation in August. People mm-hmm. are starting back at school. Mm-hmm. So it's really about that 90-day window where almost every single week there's a 100 million plus you know, budgeted movie coming out. What was it about Jaws that you know, kind of set this trend of releasing these big budget, you know, blockbuster type films. Uh, and it's still around again, 40 years later mm-hmm. or something that, that Jaws started. What was it about? Was that their thought process? What was their thought process that went into doing it this way? No, that you're absolutely right. In fact, the films, at least up until that point, I mean, we kind of talk earlier, we can talk twenties and thirties, but in the seventies, sixties and seventies, films would often get released at selected theaters, and they would kind of in, in you know larger metrop, you know metrop, metropolitan areas, uh, you know New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Houston, things like that, and then they would kind of flow out into smaller markets. What Paramount did, and and Spielberg kind of pushed for, pushed for this, was to have it be released in more theaters at once, and so fairly for kind of for the, for the first time, in in a while, there was this big promotional push. Uh, they hyped up the film. They bought uh, TV commercials. They did print ads. They did billboards. Um, and you're right. They sent it at this June release date. Um, so they capitalized on, you know, students getting out of school, uh, wanting to beat the heat, going to an air-conditioned, you know, theater and, and kind of getting away. And when the film opened, it opened about 400 theaters, which was still, and by today's standards, right, is small, right? That, that's, that's you know, that's the uh, more kind of uh, Oscar-worthy uh, small films are usually we get kind of that smaller 400 release. You're talking, you know, three, four thousand theaters for the big ones. But they released at a, a overwhelmingly large number, 400 screens the opening weekend. People lined up around the block because they had been kind of seeing these advertisements. They've been, what is this all about? And it made, I think, oh gosh, I, I will, I have it written down, but I think it made like 17 million in its opening weekend, which again, by today's standards, is oh, my, the movie was kind of maybe even a flop, but it broke uh, a record for the opening weekend. They most it had ever had, and so that kind of sold it. And so, in some ways, Jaws kind of begins this idea of a blockbuster, especially of a summer blockbuster, as you mentioned, um, because they took the time to prepare the audience uh, through you know through newspapers, through magazines, through television, for, through uh, radio and other billboards, um, and got them kind of hyped up, come do it. And then once they went and saw it, it was an excellent film. And so tell your neighbors, tell your friend, tell your mom, tell your dad, uh, you know, let's go again. Same kind of thing. Let's get out of the heat. There's not much to do. School just got out. Uh, and, and so it kind of started it off. And it, you know, goes on to make almost a quarter of a billion dollars, which, again, by today's standards, is actually pretty good. But by then it was monumental. Well, and one of the things that I recall, obviously, from my childhood is, is the affordability of movies, which mm-hmm. is unfortunately no longer there. I remember um, <laughs> the, the theater that I'd referenced earlier that's uh, walking distance from my house, uh, Wednesday mornings were $2. Mm. And this was for first run. Oh, wow. And so, um, you know, those days are gone. I mean, the cheapest, there's a couple theaters you can go for like the second run films, you know, sure. you get in for two, three bucks. But I mean, even I just took my son to see Star Wars on the IMAX. And the tickets were seventeen dollars a piece. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, which is ironic because a lot of these films are still doing just fine, even with all of the other screens that we have in the Netflix and mm-hmm. the on demand. Uh, it's surprising that film is still such a major part of our culture, and I'm happy that it is. Mm-hmm. So, um, one final question I have for you: sure. um, 
what is it if if you could sum up to our listeners out there what is it outside of maybe some of the things that we discussed about film that makes you so passionate to the point where you're you're going to you know take a, a fair amount of time to spend you know researching this film mm-hmm. why is it and what is it about film that really has left this type of impact on you in your career and allows you to use that in other ways in the classroom that's a great question um I think that maybe one of the first thoughts that kind of comes to my mind is that film is kind of a great unifier. It is uh, perhaps one of the best forms of kind of democratic communication. And when you sit back and at least think about it, at least in terms of film as like a movie, uh, you know, you go in and you buy a ticket and you sit in a dark room in your own seat with, you know, 20, 30, 40, 100 other strangers Right when you kind of think about it like that, you think, man, that's I, I no. When's the last time you went into a room with just a bunch of strangers and sat in the dark? Uh, but we go and we do it, right? And and we and you become kind of united as as you go. You laugh together, you cry together, you cheer, you clap. Even so much that you'll you'll kind of police one another, right? That person pulling out their phone, you you feel you may not in normal everyday circumstances feel you know the need to tell someone to be quiet or put their phone away, but you'll do it in that instance, right? Uh, and so I think film brings together uh, all walks of life, right? And, and, and kind of unifies everyone. And they share in that experience together. Um, and so I think that for me is, 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 you know, I'm sure I could think of other things, but right off the top of my head, I believe that is really something that I appreciate about film uh, and, and movies as, as an art form, as a way to kind of look at it, is that it allows for everyone to partake. Um, doesn't matter old, young, you know, race, ethnicity, gender, does not matter, right? You get to kind of participate and you get to do it and you buy in as a group and you get to have that group experience. But it's also strangely personal too, right? I mean, when's the last time you looked around to your left and right when you're sitting in a theater? No, it's still just you and the screen, but you and the screen and 200 of the strangers, you know, <laughs> doing eating popcorn and drinking soda. Of course. Well, Jared, we at the Nightly News are certainly doing everything that we can to help promote this event. Um, we're very, very much looking forward to this opportunity to for the Humanities Film Series. And frankly, I appreciate you sort of uh, biting the bullet and going first on this one. Oh, I, was glad uh, I, I specifically said, hey, I'll go anywhere. I just don't want to go first <laughs> because uh, it, I'm going to be very intrigued by how you approach it. And I'm going to you know, try to use some of this. And I've, again, obviously, our two films are, are polar opposites, mm-hmm. uh, but I, I do want to sort of see how you sort of mm-hmm. structure the whole thing because I'm very interested. I've, I've been to things like this before, mm-hmm. but I'm very interested because I've never actually done one myself. Oh. So I'm very, very much looking forward to this. So we at the Nightly News, we wish you a best of luck on Friday, January 26th. So that'll be in the Capitol Blue Cross Theater. The first about 30 minutes, so from 6.30 to 7, will be a commentary on mm-hmm. the film, and we'll screen the film. It's about, what, an hour and 45 minutes or so? so? about two hours and six minutes. Two hours and six minutes. Mm-hmm. And then there'll be uh, some time afterward for a Q&A session. So we wish you the absolute best of luck, and we look forward to coming out and seeing Jaws. Well, thank you, Paul. This was a pleasure. I appreciated doing it. Hey, and we would love to have you back sometime soon. We can maybe reflect on how it went. That'd be wonderful. All right. Well, uh, so for Professor Reif, uh, my name is Professor Paul Miller, and we will catch you next time on the Net the News Podcast. Save the date for the upcoming Humanities Film Series featuring three of our Humanities and Sciences faculty doing a broadcast commentary on movies that meant a lot to them in their past. They're going to do a little talk back, and they're also going to present the film and take a question and answer session afterward. Uh, On January 26th, Jared Reif will present Jaws. On April 27th, Professor Paul Miller, that's me, will present The Big Lebowski. And on July 27th, Dr. Marcy Roven will feature Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. So save the date for those wonderful film series presentations. Welcome to the Nightly News Podcast. This is Professor Paul Miller sitting at the Nasir Harris Podcast Studio. I'm so pleased to be joined today by uh, Alumni Engagement Director Sarah Blumenshine. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks so much for having me. 
not a problem at all. And it's uh, your uh, time every term that we have you in. And we're going to talk all things alumni for 2018. Um, we're also joined in her final podcast as a student, we will put, because I know Sherry said that uh, she wouldn't mind coming back and joining the Nightly News podcast in the future. But Sherry, the president of the Nightly News, we are sitting here as we record this in her final days as being a Central Penn College student. So Sherry, welcome and thank you for being here today. I'm excited to be here. Thanks. Well, before we get into the alumni events, uh, Sherry, I wanted to just chat with you for a few minutes about, uh, you know, what you are up to these days, you know, uh, especially with the Alumni Council. I know that this is something that you've been involved with for quite some time now, and it's definitely something that you're planning on being a part of in the future. Uh, can you tell us about anything or any new initiatives for the Alumni Council that you guys have been working on over the past, say, four to six months? Uh, well, for my area specifically, I'm on the Alumni Awards and Recognition Committee, and we met beginning of this month, and we were just discussing of ways to, new ways to recognize our alumni in 2018, um, focusing on some more social media posts, um, how to find out what people are doing and how to engage with them to just let everybody know what's been happening in their lives, um, any promotions businesses that they might start, um, new jobs, you know, that sort of thing. And what is it about the Alumni Council that drew you to uh, the, the group uh, as something that you wanted to spend your time on? Because obviously we've talked many times in the past about how busy you are running your own business, having a family, being a student. Uh, how do you find time to do this and why are you so passionate about joining the organization? Well, uh, I got involved in it because Sarah invited me. Um, I used to, well, I still do sometimes hang out in the ATEC uh, lobby kind of where outside of Sarah's office and just from sitting there and, and engaging with her and talking with her I had some ideas I'm an idea person and uh, I just like to find out more about what Central Penn's doing what the alumni are doing and for me personally as an alumna also is I didn't realize all the things that the alumni were doing um, the benefits of being an alumni of Central Penn there's some things I think and that's part of the recognition and awards and just letting people know that there are some things that the alumni can do here at Central Penn that a lot of people don't know about, and just getting that word out. And they're fun people to hang out with. Well, Who doesn't love Sarah? Well, uh, <laughs> and certainly part of this, too, is it does give you an opportunity to continue networking. And to be perfectly honest with you, one of the things that I try in as many classes as I possibly can is to try to help students understand what networking means. I think a lot of times when we think of the word networking, it can be it can be intimidating. And I think that the being a part of the Alumni Council, or if nothing else, if you're an alumni out there, just being a part of some of these events allows you a very valuable opportunity to network with peers and maybe people who may be able to advance your career. So obviously joining the alumni uh, council for you is a good way to do that, but you're also uh, allowing other people the opportunity to continue this networking in a very easy and almost always free way. Mm -hmm. So uh, Sherry, one final question I have for you before we talk about what the alumni council and the alumni, uh, um, Sarah in her office, the alumni engagement office, have coming up. Uh, Sherry, obviously it's a bittersweet for myself and many people in the nightly news that you will unfortunately no longer be our president. We did elect Brian Christiana as the new president. I would love if, uh, you know, at our final meeting, maybe you give him some words of wisdom because I do think that we are in good hands. But what did being the president in 2017 of the nightly news, what impact did that have on you and, and potentially in your future career? Uh, for me, just being involved in the nightly news, first of all, gave me a chance to practice my skills, uh, to talk to people I probably would not have talked to, different professors, faculty members, and also being a, quote, seasoned uh, student, um, interacting with the college students, you know, the, quote, normal age. Uh, was it interesting what is for normal me? Anymore, uh, yeah, though. I don't know if it's normal, but the traditional, I guess, would be the more accurate term. Uh, just engaging with them and offering advice that I could, and just for them to let me know different trends that are happening. And I always like to be involved with things. I, I've been involved in band boosters and PTOs, and it's just something I'm I'm wired to do. And to be able to do that and practice different skills and know about like podcasting or video or just writing and blogging, uh, learning that was beneficial and fun. 
Well, I'm really glad, and I certainly hope that you, uh, one of the things maybe you do in the future is if you're putting together like an online portfolio, link to your feature stories, link to your podcast, link to some of the video that we've done in class. Uh, I really think that uh, you're obviously the, the complete package as a communication student, and I'm sure it's not going to be too long until you find a, a job that's interesting to you and uh, you know in, enhances your career. So Sherry, from the bottom of my heart, and certainly I, I'm speaking for the entire club, we are absolutely going to miss you. I'm going to continue sending you the emails. This is something okay. I did with Norm, like <laughs> when we were doing our... Uh, when we, when we have our agendas and things like that, just so you can know what's going on. Uh, and I, I do appreciate that you're going to do this final magazine for us. I, and I told Brian I would be keeping my eye on him. So y- You should. <laughs> I, think some, I think he needs someone to keep uh, their eye on him. Well, Sherry, again, thank you so much for doing this. And, uh, you know, it, it really... How far we've come this year is really uh, attributed to you and your leadership. Uh, obviously, it was a team effort, but... I, I don't know that we would be where we are today without you. So really, it, it means a lot. And you've been so, so, so much help to us to advance as a group. So I just want to thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, you know, I have to point out that in 2018, Sherry is going to be on campus four times a year for alumni council meetings. So we might just have to schedule some special podcast um, sessions. Well, and to be perfectly honest, you know, we want to have you on once a term. So maybe we can just do those that day and and there we go that's one each term so sold (laughs) there we go so we look forward to having you back sherry and and catching us up with uh you know what you have coming up and the job that you're going to get in a very short order all right uh sarah i want to come back to you here um one of the things that i I enjoy doing is having you on each term and having a very alumni focused podcast and we're going to talk about some of the big things that we have coming up here from an alumni perspective in 2018 uh one of the biggest things that i before we get into 2018 that i would like to talk about is recently in december you and the alumni uh the alumni council and other alumni from central penn took a trip to new york city and this is something that you do each year and i was hoping that you could sort of recap that trip tell us a little bit more about what you did and the fun that you had well sure it's the new york city bus trip is such a great time the alumni really have a great response to it every year. It's one of our signature events. And the Alumni Association's social committee plans this event. Uh, we've always had, you know, one to two buses, um, but we found that this year and last year we really do need to take two buses. Next year we had an incredible response. We sold out very quickly for this trip. Sherry came along with with um, with Trevor with with and, and then Shannon. who else came did she come but yeah yes. trevor and shannon were able to go mm-hmm. and so we had a great mix of people we had some um faculty members we had a lot of graduates and their families and guests and we also had which was amazing some of the theater students came with the theater director so they were able to experience a broadway show they went to see school of rock and then as soon as we got to new york city the whole group got a uh, a group photo in the theater district and everybody was able to just spend the day on their own exploring the city seeing the beautiful lights and the christmas attractions and displays and um Personally, I went with my sister and my other sister and my mother because um, my uh, middle sister is a Central Penn PTA graduate, and we just had a blast. It was it was a great time. Ate so much food. <laughs> <laughs> Did you go anywhere interesting as far as food-wise? Um, yes. We went to Patsy's, and it's near Columbus Circle in New York, and it's the best Alfredo that I've ever had in my life, and that's saying something. Um but it's a beautiful Italian restaurant, um, and it was well worth the wait and the money, and we just kind of were able to stay there for the better part of the afternoon, just enjoying one another's company. So this is something that you do every year, and really it's just sort of uh, the camaraderie on the way up, and then once you get there, it's sort of come as you are and go wherever you'd like and just be back here in time to catch the bus yeah and that's sort of thing exactly that's what people love about it because it's so affordable um it's only 50 dollars per ticket which is a fantastic deal oh my gosh absolutely (laughs) 
And um, so, so alumni really love that. They love the price. They love that they can have a day on their own and that everything's taken care of for them. All they have to do is show up at the right time so that we can catch the bus back. And we watched some movies on the way there and the way back. And um, we actually polled everyone at the end of this trip just to find out, well, where would you be interested in going if we branched out and started some more trips? And people are really interested in Baltimore, in Washington, D.C., um, maybe an amusement park. So we're looking into some different options with the social committee and also with the Young Alumni Committee, maybe partnering together for next year to add another bus trip. Fantastic. And uh, again, it's just one more opportunity for alumni to do something special, to put, throw in a little networking, but really just have fun in an affordable fashion. I mean, 50 bucks to get to New York is, is insane because if you're driving up there yourself, you're paying a lot more than that, especially with tolls and parking and all those things. So, all right. Well, let's uh, shift our focus here, Sarah, to a few of the major things that you have coming up. And the first one I want to talk about is something that's available for alumni. This is going to be on February the 20th, and it's going to be the CPEC Job Fair. Um, can you tell us a little more about what role alumni can play in the CPEC Job Fair? Well, Steve Hassinger with our Career Services Department is going to be so happy that we're talking about this um, because this is one of career services signature events that they always offer. The CPEC Consortium is a huge benefit to alumni because it allows them to take advantage of this job and internship fair. They can come for free, um, so there's nothing that they have to pay to attend to interact with employers, with one another, to make some great connections. Um, you can only attend for free if your school that you graduated from is a CPEC member, which we are. And if you want any more information on the CPEC job fair in particular, so if you want more info, you can go to www.cpec.info. And the, the interesting thing and something I do want to point out is this is the biggest job fair that we are a part of every single year. Um, we do something here on campus in the fall. But this one is the big boy. This is where all the heavy hitters come. Because it's so many different schools, I believe it's 13 different schools that are uh, associated with this. So it, this is going to be much, much larger than even the one we have here on campus. Um, so again, if you are interested in this job fair, it is coming up on February the 20th. It'll be at the Radisson in Camp Hill. Just reach out to Steve Hassinger at centralpen.edu. He can give you some more information, or you can always go to cpec.info. And um, this, that more information about this will be up with the story as well. Yes. Now, Sherry, I want to go to you here. This is actually a place where you have some fond memories from last year. Can you tell us a little bit more about your experience at CPEC in 2017? Yes, um, that is where I found my internship. I uh, was there just kind of networking and looking at what was available and I was going up to all the different organizations that were there. There was a wide variety of um, industries and the one place I went to was a robotics industrial display and I said, you know, I'm a communications major and she said, well, we're really looking for robotics but our digital communications person is actually looking for a content writer. And so I gave her my resume and she looked over it. And then about a week and a half later, I had my internship offered to me. So that, that was a great experience for me. <laughs> now, can you, obviously you went there, you were very successful. You basically got your internship just by going there. You weren't looking at that specific business. It was just sort of a, you know, a, a situation that arose right in front of you. Can you just give our alumni that may be interested in coming to CPEC Job Fair a couple of tips to prepare them? Because obviously one of the most important things when going to a job fair is preparation. Absolutely. Um, I actually did my resume and I had Steve Hassinger look it over, um, give us some suggestions of, he offered the suggestion of doing some bullet points because at the job fair, they actually have recruiters standing there and they look at your resume and they make notes on it. And by having a bullet point list, they can see your qualifications very quickly. And I also, you know, professional dress, know your elevator speech, which is basically who you are, why you're there, what you're looking for in, you know, 30 seconds, a minute, 30 seconds. And then um, practice having eye contact. That was the biggest thing I noticed that watching the recruiters that are there they're looking for eye contact they make notes about that and to know i had a clear direction of why i was there i was seeking an internship what i thought would be a year later <laughs> right but uh you know this just happened to be available and for a communications major specifically you have to go up to every business because 
there's not a lot of specific communications companies out there, but every business needs some kind of communications. In 2017 and beyond into 2018, I I really think that that is one of the, the things, and I talk about this in class a lot, that every business needs somebody in communications, whether it's a small business, whether it's a larger business, there needs to be somebody controlling the flow of information, both internally and externally. And I think that that's one of the reasons why our program is poised for for huge growth, because every business, you know, five years ago, not every business was employing someone in communications. It was, you know, the owner in a small business that was the, were doing it. And it, there's so much on the line as far as a digital presence goes that you need to have somebody that knows what they're doing. Uh, one final thing, Sherry, that I would suggest to alumni going, do some research at the cpec.info website. Um, I'm sure closer to the event, they're going to put the players who are going to be there. And having a few – now, in your situation, you didn't necessarily – you were just walking around talking to everybody, which is a great way to approach it. But at least go in there with like a handful of businesses that you want to target and go first, and then you can walk around after. And I think that's another but I, I great did advice. do that. I um, looked at the list of companies, and I Googled every one of them. <laughs> and the larger ones, they actually had – communication jobs open i went to them first but then after that i just walked around to see because some of the businesses have a large crowd and um, the rg group where i had my internship there wasn't a lot of people standing there so i was able just to go up and and it also even if they didn't have something it you practice talking to people you know people that are new and presenting yourself and i think that that just being out and networking and practicing that part when you do find your click or your your niche that you feel very comfortable and the people that are recruiting will recognize that you feel comfortable and knowledgeable. So we're talking about the CPEC job fair. That's going to be February the 20th. You can find more information by emailing Steve Hassinger at centralpen.edu or going to cpec.info. All right, Sarah, there's another thing that I want to talk about. And this is obviously one of the biggest events that you have each and every year. And it is the Easter Bunny Breakfast. This year will take place on March the 24th. And it will be from 8 to 10 a.m. So I'm just going to throw it to you. Can you give us a, you know, a brief st- summary of what, you know, what can be expected if the alumni comes out for the Easter Bunny breakfast? It's such a wonderful morning for our families um, and for our faculty and staff who uh, would like to bring their families. It's the second year that we're hosting this event, and it's held in the um, Night and Day Cafe. I was about to say Scoozies, so a lot of our alumni who are listening would recognize that name, I'm sure. Um, So it's in the Night and Day Cafe and also in the lounge. And this year we're expanding it to the patio um, because we plan to have an Easter egg hunt out on the patio. So we offer so many different things for kids to do. It's it's a great affordable rate. Um, you can go to centralpen.edu slash Easter for all of the costs. And you get a full all-you-can-eat breakfast. Last year we had chocolate chip pancakes. We had bacon. We had tater tots. Um, you name it. Um, so, so everyone really enjoyed the spread and then you get a free photo with an Easter bunny and you get to do crafts and activities and we'll be adding even more crafts and activities this year. So it's just a great morning. And what we love about it, the social committee is that this kicks off activities for the day. We partner with East Pensboro Township. They also hold an Easter egg hunt, but it's not until the afternoon. So really in the morning, it's a way to just have a fun-filled day where you start off at Central Penn College, and then you go and have some lunch, and then head over to Adams Rickey Park to take take part in the Easter egg hunt fun there. I see here also on the website, Sarah, that it says some Central Penn alumni wanted to give their fellow Knights an Easter present, and that several breakfast tickets have already been paid for. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. uh, We... We as a social committee with the Alumni Council wanted to make sure that if there were some families that wanted to attend but cost was an issue, that, uh, you know, we could have alumni go ahead and say, we want to help sponsor a family of four to attend. So last year, we had several people just graciously donate um, several tickets, and it was was amazing um, just the gratitude from the alumni who used those tickets. It was a great feeling, and so we were really happy to do that and we'll be offering it again in 2018 and if you'd like more information about these uh tickets that have been donated please email alum at centralpen.edu and those are first come first serve 
So, Sarah, I want to wrap up the podcast here today by going over just a few sort of save the date items of some important things that you have coming up in 2018. Uh, the first big one beyond the Easter Bunny Breakfast and the CPEC Job Fair will take place on July 13th. That will be the annual Alumni Senators game. Can you just give us a quick 30 seconds about what uh, you know people maybe that haven't been there or weren't there last year, what they can expect if they come out? Sure. Um, the the Senators game. If you're not familiar with um, you know the Harrisburg area, it's it's the FNB Field Stadium, and the Harrisburg Senators, the the ball team, they play there. And so we've had our annual picnic there for several years. Um, we have a picnic. We have a reunion. Um, people can stay for the game at a very affordable rate. I guess you can see the trend where we're going here. As an alumni benefit, we want to make sure that we're offering graduates you know, something that they can't get anywhere else. Um, as, and as a Central Penn graduate, this is an exclusive benefit for them. Um, so it's an amazing rate. And they can come out. And we just recently had to move from center field to the giant pavilion area because we just have so many people who are interested. Um, so we went from about 100 people two years ago coming out to 170 this past year, and we expect that to increase in 2018. That's incredible. Uh, one final thing that I'd like to talk about, again, as far as the save the date type thing for 2018, is Sarah's uh, you know, brainchild, uh, the Alumni Feast and Brews Reunion Tent accompanying Fall Harvest, and that will take place on Saturday October the 20th. So take those two dates down, alumni. July 13th for the Senators game on City Island in Harrisburg. And October the 20th for the Alumni Feast and Brews Reunion Tent alongside Fall Harvest on October 20th. Uh, Sarah, again, thank you so much for taking the time out, and of course Sherry as well. Uh, Sarah, so much, thank you so much for taking the time out to be here with us, and, and again, hopefully this is something we can do every single term. When Sherry is here for Alumni Council, we'll drag her down here and do one of these podcasts, and you can keep us updated with Alumni Council. Sarah, if you could just give uh, whatever contact information is, is easiest. Uh, the one final thing that I know you wanted me to talk about was uh, that you're looking for some of our alumni to update their information. Uh, so can you just give a quick what type of, of correspondence you'd be looking for and how they can get in touch with you? Sure. Um, I The biggest thing that I want to make sure of, that's one of my my biggest goals in 2018 is to make sure that we have updated information for our alumni and mainly so that you know what is going on with Central Penn with your alma mater so that you can stay abreast of all of your alumni benefits of the events and the programs that are being designed specifically for you. So um, what I'm looking for is updated mailing addresses, emails, um, phone numbers, just so that we can get this information to you. And the best way for you to get in touch with me is to email alum, A-L-U-M, as in Mary, at centralpen.edu, or to call me at 717-728-2295. But if you aren't able to do that, if you don't have a lot of time, you just need to you know, log on at midnight, as I know that with Sherry's schedule, she's so busy <laughs> sometimes. Um, you can go online to centralpen.edu slash let us know. And that's a fantastic place to submit an update, not only on your contact information, but also on what you're doing. Um, if you want to submit a class note for Pendulum for the alumni magazine, you can do it there. And we, we absolutely love to hear updates from you. Fantastic. And again, Sherry, I just, again, I, I am hoping that we can have you back every term to continue doing this, and I certainly hope that you and I stay in touch, and I'll certainly reach out to you if I hear of any jobs, but again, I, I can't thank you enough for everything you've done. It's You've you've really helped our club come such a long way, so uh, my, my congratulations, and just remember that we will all be here very, very sad that you're no longer with us at our club meeting. So. She is mine now. <laughs> Sherry, thank you again so much for everything. We You're really welcome. appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, that's it for this edition of the Nightly News Podcast. We'll be back soon with some more uh, very, very interesting guests coming up in the spring term, as well as some awesome guests in our winter term as well. So we look forward to having you back each week with the Nightly News Podcast. All right, so for Nightly News Club president for another week or so, Sherry Long, and Alumni Engagement Director Sarah Blumenshine, this is Professor Paul Miller. And we'll catch you next time on the Nightly News Podcast. <laughs> <laughs>